Bunbury. Turtle Bunbury is an author, historian, and public speaker based in Ireland. His books include Ireland's Forgotten Past in 2020 and uh, in in also 1847, A Chronicle of Genius, Generosity, and Savagery, and the award-winning Vanishing Ireland series. Uh, Hope in 1847 is Bunbury's most recent book, and his next book is going to be the Irish, and I hope I can say this correctly, Diaspora launches in March of 2021. Turtle. Thank you, Chief Gary, uh, for those uh, kind words, and you're nearly there. Diaspora is the magic word. Okay. <laughs> um, but uh, greetings, everybody from Ireland. I'm a historian uh, based in Ireland, and indeed, uh, I'm coming at you live from uh, the Emerald Isle right now. I live in County Carlo. Or, or what you would call Conte Ciarlach uh, in the Irish language. Um, and my aim is to give you a little background on um, the Irish famine or the great hunger, uh, as it is also known. Uh, I think it's important to backpedal very quickly and give some context uh, on Irish history. So 1000 years ago, uh, as the map shows, Ireland, uh, like Britain, was a bunch of mini kingdoms with uh, a number of Viking cities around our coastline. You can see Dyflin there where Dublin is today. 1066, um, the, uh, the famous uh, battle in, in, uh, British his in English history when the Normans famously defeated the Anglo-Saxons um, and took control of our neighboring island or, or most of it. Just over a hundred years after that, the grandsons and great-grandsons of those Norman warriors come piling into Ireland. They take over land, they build castles and they develop our towns and cities. The Normans never really conquered Ireland and there was plenty of Irish fightbacks over the ensuing centuries, as well as civil wars uh, and indeed long periods of peace. Um, but the screws really began to tighten with this guy, Henry VIII, uh, the Tudor King of England, who declared himself the King of Ireland. And he set in motion a new age of conquest um, during the reign of his daughter, Queen Elizabeth, famous Queen Elizabeth. So the English then conquered Munster in Southwest Ireland, almost half a million acres of which um, this guy, Sir Walter Raleigh or Rawley, he scored about 42,000 acres uh, for his efforts. And it's, it's interesting that a lot of the warriors who participated in El Elizabeth's Irish wars are familiar names in American history too, right? Uh, Rally or Rawley is credited with bringing the potato back to Europe. Actually, that link is kind of through his buddy, a guy called Thomas Harriet, uh, who lived for a while in County Waterford in, in the south of Ireland. Uh, he came across potatoes when he wintered with the Pamlico Indians in uh, North Carolina in 1585, and he brought them back to these parts. In any case, over the course of the uh, 17th century, the conquest of Ireland was completed. It became a religious war. Uh, put crudely, it was Protestant England and Protestant Scotland against Catholic Ireland. And the Irish fought back sometimes with incredible gusto, but there was division amongst them and a lot of bad luck too, and they were defeated every time. If you look at this map, you'll see the blue part, that's Munster, which was seized uh, during the reign of Queen Elizabeth, as I mentioned. The red and orange, uh, that was planted by her successor, James I, who was also the King of Scotland. And that yellow section, that's kind of Ireland's badlands. With each defeat, uh, the most affluent uh, section of Catholic society was stripped of its lands. And tens of thousands of them emigrated to Europe. They joined the Catholic armies of Spain and France and so on. Many more crossed to the New World, to America and Canada. Uh, we know them as the wild geese. But for those um, who remained, um, who stayed, who didn't, couldn't get out, uh, many of them were pushed into the barren lands of Connacht, the badlands, if you will. It's very beautiful, incredible landscapes to visit, Connemara, Donegal, Mayo, places like that, but very tricky to farm or make a living out of. Uh, and indeed, the whole forced relocation to the west of Ireland very much echoes what would happen to the indigenous people of America uh, in, in the centuries to come. 
The saving grace uh, of a sort were potatoes. Uh, nutritious, calorie dense, uh, they're very easy to grow in Irish soil and you don't need a lot of space. This is the outline of some lazy bread, uh, lazy beds, we call them, for growing potatoes near my wife's family home in County Monaghan. But you'll see outlines of these furrows all over Ireland to this day. And basically, very quickly, uh, a, a huge chunk of the Irish population became almost totally dependent on potatoes for subsistence. And any failure of that crop could have disastrous uh, effects. And the crops did fail. The first major catastrophe was in 1740, when an intense cold spell uh, caused all the potatoes underground uh, across Ireland to freeze and then rot. And as much as 20% of the population is said to have died uh, as a result of the famine that followed that. Fast forward um, 100 years to the 1840s, uh, and the situation was even worse because the population had quadrupled over a few short decades to maybe eight and a half million people. Uh, and the island simply couldn't sustain uh, those numbers. Uh, in fact, at least two million of those people, nearly a quarter of Ireland, uh, were living in extreme poverty in single room mud cabins. Meanwhile, Ireland itself was a massive player within the British Empire. Huge numbers of Irish were serving in the Empire's army, in the Royal Navy, in the colonial services. Uh, the fertile Irish farmland was a big part of this. It provided beef and, and dairy products for the colonies uh, and wheat for Britain itself. Um, Ireland was really the granary of uh, Britain. It supplied enough grain to feed a quarter of its population but catastrophically, uh, the landowners, many of whom didn't even live in Ireland, uh, they didn't want people on their land because people didn't make money. Uh, they preferred cattle and sheep uh, and cornfields, uh, which did make money. Um, so unfortunately, some of them began to clear their lands of people. They're raising rents and terminating leases and forcing evictions. Uh, which led to a massive uh, number of homeless on the eve of the famine. Where could the people go? Some escaped to the UK, to the US and elsewhere. Many found themselves in the dreaded workhouse. Um, these were sort of last refuge for people who'd run out of luck. Uh, they're horrible places. I've been inside them. They're deliberately cold and miserable. It's a brutal uh, Dickensian world. Uh, and once you've entered the workhouse, uh, you could uh, supposedly you could never leave. All of this makes for an absolute nightmare when the potato crop was hit by a fungus, a blight. Uh, it arrived from the Americas, probably Mexico, and killed about a third of the crop in 1845 and decimated it again and again over the next five years. The Prime Minister at the start of the tragedy was Robert Peel. He understood Ireland actually, and he was quite switched on. Uh, he imported a hundred thousand pounds worth of corn from America to Ireland in 1845 to feed people, despite protests from grain merchants in Britain and Ireland who were a very powerful lobby group at the time. But then Peel fell from power and a new Whig government in London came in and they decided it would be better to laissez faire to let it be, to let the market decide. And that's why some call it the great hunger or the great starvation, because there was food in Ireland, but the laws of the free market meant that grain could be exported without having to distribute it amongst the poor and hungry at home. So you have this crazy situation of maybe 4,000 food carrying ships leaving Ireland in 1847 alone. And the crop kept failing. 1847 was the worst year of all, Black 47 we call it. There was a massive uh, rise in the number of people fleeing to the workhouses, a hundred or more workhouses around Ireland, going there for sustenance, but the workhouses were soon utterly overcrowded and rife with disease and huge numbers died, especially children, um, from malnutrition, typhus, dysentery, cholera, 
Uh, about a million are said to have died by 1850, and the victims were mostly vulnerable underclasses, uh, the cottiers, the laborers, the small tenant farmers, uh, the homeless, and uh, many of those who died were Irish speakers. It's hard to tell the story without generalizing and hurling out big numbers, but when you read through the workhouse records, it becomes very moving to read the names of the dead, um, and a bit like today's horror, to realize that every single one of those names represents a person who lived and breathed like you and I. Uh, we are still getting to grips with it all 175 years later, uh, as well as a million dead, uh, another million or so emigrated. So we'd lost almost a quarter of our population by 1851. Half a million uh, left Ireland in 1847 alone primarily to the UK and Canada, and then to the US. It had an immense knock-on effect. For example, Toronto, the population trebled to 60,000 over the course of 1847, most of those newcomers coming from Ireland. Meanwhile, the population of Ireland continued to decrease year on year until the first increase in 1971. So even now, there's not even seven million on this island where we were once, as I say, maybe eight and a half million or more. Uh, the UK's population has quadrupled in the same time. Um, ownership of land would be a, a major legacy of the famine era and a political one too. The notion that people should be entitled to security of tenure uh, and indeed ownership of land. But arguably the more, most enduring legacy was emigration. Uh, most emigrants left via the Port of Cove or Queenstown in Cork Harbour, which you're looking at there. Uh, and that became known as the Town of Tears, again, slightly echoing the Trail of Tears. Uh, the famine forms the backstory of millions of Irish American family histories, uh, including Ronald Reagan, JFK, uh, and indeed Joe Biden. Uh, and for some people, that experience has hardened into a belief that the famine was genocide, deliberately perpetuated by the uh, British authorities. I don't go with that, but I do think there was greed and negligence and gross incompetence on top of a terrible calamity. But today we are talking about kindness and positivity and hope and generosity, of which there was also plenty in the Great Hunger. I think of the gentleman you're looking at there, of Ben Forbes on the right, a Boston merchant who stuffed a warship called the USS Jamestown uh, with food and clothing and sailed it from Boston to Ireland at the height of the famine. I think of the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire who donated heavily to an Ireland relief fund. Um, and I think of Rodney Baxter who sailed a schooner full of corn and flour from Barnstable, Massachusetts, across the Atlantic to County Sligo. But the standout story is, of course, the money collected from the chiefs of the Choctaw Nation, uh, which stood out then and it stands out today as a beautiful parable, really, in a sometimes a gloomy world. Um, uh, the event is commemorated in Ireland in the town of Middleton, County Cork, by Alex Pentec's wonderful sculpture. Uh, it has the appropriate name, Kindred Spirits. It's an absolute favourite of mine. And I am now delighted to hand over to Alex, uh, who will tell you about the creative process uh, behind this magnificent work. Thank you for your time.